That was me, not Andy. Good morning, Mount Pleasant. Stand in body or spirit and let's worship. I turn this off because otherwise you're here talking during the live stream. If you ever go back and watch that. So sometimes they say wild stuff. Oh, oh, I thought we were doing the opening video again. Sorry. All right. I'm all distracted. Sorry, guys. I shouldn't be alive My future was six feet under One foot in the grave No hope to be saved Yeah, I shouldn't be alive But I'm a miracle child Defied every diagnosis And as close as it came I can stand here say I'm a miracle child So if you didn't know, our sermon series this month is called Sticks, not the 80s band. Um, so it'll be about like all the famous trees from the Bible. So I'm looking forward to see where Dennis takes this one. But relating to that, the next song we're going to do is a new song, and it talks about how we are the branch and Jesus is the vine. So I thought that fit well with the sermon series. I hope you guys like it. My 
daily bread I depend on you I depend on you for the sun to rise for my sleep at night I depend on you I depend friends, what's up? How are you? Oh, are we, are we tired? A little sleepy? Yeah? Uh, well, I'm excited to see your faces um, and excited that you're here this morning. Um, I have to tell you a story. It's normally how we start. Uh, so this week, every Thursday, I go to Walmart to get stuff for grace drops. And I normally go to 46, but on Thursday mornings, I go to 41. Um, and like the past two months, here's, what, here's been my thought. These carts are a little high. And I posted on Facebook this week because I think they're a little tall. And I am like jolly green giant size. Like, and I'm like, these are a little awkward. They're just weird. Like, I, I, and I could not get past. Like, eh, I'm telling you, every single week I've thought about this. <laughs> I wish I was joking. <laughs> I'm not. Um, so I was like, I have to ask. I need to ask if other people think these are a little weird. And the conclusion was yes. And people think they're, too, they're a little too tall. Um, and so I don't know if you, if, is anyone on the those are great cart bandwagon? 
Okay, okay, okay. I'm not hating on them. <laughs> but I just thought, man, that's so, I don't know. So then I got my answer. Most people don't enjoy them, which is great. But then I thought, how did, how did Walmart land on this choice? Like, did they do studies? Did they bring in people? Like, what was the process to design a new cart? Like, I don't have those answers yet. I'll let you know when I figure them out. <laughs> I'm just telling you, like, I wish I, could, I wish I could tell you that this is not how my brain works every day, but it is. <laughs> um, one time it was the Basler's popcorn. How did they get, like, such round popcorn? There's a certain type of popcorn. Did you know that? No, probably not, but I do. <laughs> Anyways, I'm super glad you're here. Grateful that you joined us. Grateful that you're hanging out with us. If you would do me a favor and use, um, if you're new, use the uh, app store to get this app called Church Center. Um, that's going to be super helpful for you as you get to know what happens here on the weekly and on the daily. Um, so you can just look for that logo right there, Church Center, and then find Mount Pleasant in the list of churches. And then once you get all that done, you can click on the New Here app or the New Here tab in the app and get uh, some information. That'll be really helpful for you. It has calendars and registrations, all that jazz. So be sure to do that. Um, otherwise, we just ask that you hit those buttons uh, because it helps us stay connected with you um, and all that. Um, I do have some actual real announcements for you this morning. Uh, the first one being that um, every couple months we, we try to <coughs> excuse me fill up the pantry at 14th and Chestnut, and this month we are collecting cereal, mac and cheese, and hamburger helpers, so lots of options this, this month, not just one thing, all the things. Um, so what you can do is you can go purchase those um, and then bring those in, and our um, greeters will snag those from you, and we can put them where they go. Um, but that is a great way for us to help 14th Chestnut, who does incredible work up, uh, up uh, near the Wabash area and, and really all over Terre Haute. So I um, would encourage you to do that over the next month. The mission dinner is coming up very soon, April 27th. That feels far away, but it's not at all. Um, it's from 5 to 7. There will be a sit-down dinner, Josh and the crew providing entertainment. Um, they didn't list what that would look like, so I'm expecting some interpretive dance. Um, <laughs> dude, if you brought it, man, I'd, that'd be, oh, that'd be gold. That'd be worth the price of admission. Um, anyways... Uh, you can buy the tickets in the app or out in the lobby, um, but that supports our missionaries and organizations who are doing cool things here in Terre Haute and beyond. So would encourage you to do that. Um, it is Grace Gala week, which is probably why I'm tired and I have no filter. Um, so I would encourage you if, you, if you're like, just waiting, want to make sure you have enough people, just, just want you to just wait until the end. If, you're, if that's you, that's cool. I, I live that life too. Um, but you can still sign up to volunteer. We'd love to have you. If you're, if you're not so sure, um, one of the best ways that you can help us is to pack out the red carpet so that it feels really full in here and feels um, like, like our guests are kings and queens. So you can come, hey, uh, 5.15 on the 12th or Saturday at 3.15, maybe a little earlier than that because guests, even though the event starts at 6 and 4, Guests are here like by 4.45 and uh, 2.45. Oh. Um, so we would love for you to be a part of that. Um, you don't need to do anything to do that. Just come and show up. Um, it'll be a good time. Uh, we are, uh, the preschool is selling flowers out in the lobby as a spring fundraiser for limited time only. It's only one week. So like this week is the vibe. Like do it. Um, so uh, you can order those in the app or in the foyer, um, and that helps the preschool do what they do um, every single week and every single day for, for, the, for the tiny children. Um, then uh, flowers will be here <coughs> the week of May 1st, um, and so if you are um, waiting and being smart about planting your flowers, um, that's a perfect time. It probably won't freeze beyond that. If you're like me, you planted them last weekend. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. I love that. They're fine, I guess. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, I wanted to remind you that the offering boxes are in the front, in the back, in the lobby, and you can also give on that Church Center app. Um, one of the things that you may or may not know that we do every week for the last couple of months is we have a 
mental health circle that meets here on Fridays uh, during the day for our friends with disabilities um, and any really anyone who wants to show up. Um, but, <coughs> you know, when you have those ideas, when you hear a need and you're like, man, I think we could do that. I think that would be cool. And you're like, but it probably will fail. <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's what I do. Um, and yet it's been wildly successful. Um, a few weeks ago, we had about 40 people here <laughs> for a mental health group. Um, and um, we've been averaging about 30. So um, sometimes oh, you guys don't get a good, a cool picture. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> a little wild, but kind of exciting. Um, sometimes you guys don't get to hear those kind of things that happen throughout the week, and, and, um, and it's your giving that helps us do those things, and it's your giving that helps us experiment and, and try things that maybe we think will work but maybe won't, and um, I think giving us the space to fail is, pr is pretty cool, and we appreciate that. And so, um, and then when it does work, we celebrate, and then when it really works, it's like, oh, crap, we might need bigger spaces. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> All right, well, I just appreciate you guys, because that's making a difference, and um, it's really cool to hear our friends share about their feelings and about things that are going on in their lives um, and have space to do that, so that's pretty awesome. I'm going to pray before I derail this train any further. Um, all right, let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to be in this place and to show up uh, just for just a small part of our week here to hear about you and to learn and to grow. And we pray that you would just um, have the words that um, we hear, have them resonate in our hearts, but God also um, help them move our feet uh, so that we become people not just who hear, but who act um, like you do, God. We're so grateful. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Jess. It's always fun to jump on the train of thought with Jess. <laughs> Get through, you never know. That's right. Good morning, Mount Pleasant. It's good to be with you this morning in worship. I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles... I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, which ought to be easy to find. It's the first book in the Bible. Uh, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles spread throughout the sanctuary. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, please take that one that's in the pew with you this morning as, as our gift to you. The words will also be on the screen. If you're worshiping with us online, we're glad you're with us. Uh, you're welcome to, you can go to Version app or you can go to BibleGateway.com and you can find the scripture there. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The word of God for the people of God. Hopefully on the way in you got to pick up one of these, I think they're salmon colored, although if you got the lucky straw you got a tangerine, there were about two or three of them out there today. Uh, so on the front is a place for you to take notes, write down things uh, you may want to remember, the Lord speaks to you. On the back as always are questions for you to use in your own reflection or in your life groups, small groups, and then uh, scriptures to read throughout 
the week. If you're worshiping with us online, uh, it's available on our uh, Facebook page, and there's also a link there to the where you can find it in uh, you version that is in the Bible app. This uh, is a picture of my parents' backyard. This was the, was the baseball field uh, when I was growing up. And there was a problem with this baseball diamond. It was interrupted by three trees, one of which you can see in the far distance. That was second base. We took the trees and used them as best we could. There used to be a middle tree that's now gone. That was where the pitcher stood. And I'm standing by the tree that we used for home plate. The, 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 the one that's there that you can't see where I'm standing by is... Um, what I'm taking the picture is, is home plate. It was, had great limbs for climbing. It was a wonderful tree for climbing. In fact, the limbs were all in the right places for a young boy to be able to get up high enough to be able to see onto and maybe even climb onto the roof of the garage. I'm not saying whether that happened or not, <laughs> especially if my parents are watching. Um, but it was a great tree, and we loved those trees when I was growing up. In the fall, I would often find myself climbing some other trees. My Aunt Thelma and Uncle Lee had a small collection of apple trees, and we would go there every fall to pick apples. And I have no memory of what kind of apples they were, but I just remember that they got turned into homemade applesauce and apple butter that we enjoyed all winter long, and I can still taste it when I think about it hard enough. I didn't mind the work of picking the apples because I knew the good that was coming. My least favorite encounter with trees was when I was growing up was those Saturday mornings when Dad would announce, we're going to cut firewood today over at Uncle Ned's, and I hated cutting firewood. But I knew that if we didn't, I knew I really didn't have a choice, and I also knew that if we didn't, we would be cold all winter because we used a wood stove primarily to heat our home. I still bear the marks of those mornings, though. I have a scar that thankfully has faded over the years but there was a time when I wasn't watching and I leaned down to pick up something and I inadvertently put my head right in the path of a log that was being tossed back to the truck. That was a lot of fun going to high school on, on, on Monday morning with my head all bandaged up and having to explain how that had happened. Those trees I didn't like very much. Well, as Josh said, today we're beginning a new series called Sticks. And Kathy saw that on the upcoming list and she says, what is this, Sticks? I said, yeah, sticks, of course, as in trees. And Josh said he's curious where I'm going with this. I'm curious where I'm going with it, too, so we'll see together. <laughs> and I have to say, Pastor Rick asked me, so you're going to preach about the sycamores and the NIT? And I said, no, no, that was planned. this was planned long before that was happening, although there are, of course, sycamore trees. But we're going to be looking at the trees mentioned specifically in the Bible, some of the particular ones that... They play an important role in the story of Scripture. Whether you believe it or not, they are all over the place. We don't pay a whole lot of attention to the trees in the Bible, but they are there. Author Matthew Sleeth puts it this way. He says, other than God and people, the Bible mentions trees more than any other living thing. There's a tree on the first page of Genesis, in the first Psalm, on the first page of the New Testament, on the last page of Revelation. Trees are very often places of decision-making. And Sleeth, in fact, goes on to make this claim. He says, every significant theological event in the Bible is marked by a tree. And so as we look at these trees in Scripture, we're going to, over these next few weeks, we're also going to be looking for the ways God uses them to point us toward making good decisions, toward making decisions that honor God. Because I'm willing to bet that some of you have some decisions in your life that you're having to make or trying to make. And some may be easy decisions, just like that. And others feel like an impossible choice. Maybe you, maybe you need to spend some time by a tree. Maybe one of these biblical trees. And so the very first trees that were there in the scripture are where the most challenging decision in human history was made. They, this decision was made at a tree called the knowledge of good and evil. Now I know Christians have different opinions about whether or not these early chapters of Genesis are are word-for-word -word stories or history or whether they're parables. I mean, you know, nobody who was there at the beginning was actually writing it down. What happened? By the time it's all written down, stories have been handed down for generations. That's part of why we actually have two different accounts of creation in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And they, they're a little bit different in, how, in, in the way they say it happened. The order of things is a little different. The style of the stories is very different. Personally, I'm of the belief that these stories do represent history generally, but that the point of these stories is not historical like we think about it. It's not about names and dates and times and places and so on. The point of these stories is to tell us that God created it all, 
to affirm that loudly that God is the one who made everything. And so therefore, these stories say to us that God gets to determine the best way that life is to be lived. And so with that said, we're told that after God created everything, including humanity in the form of Adam and Eve, although Eve doesn't actually get a name until well into chapter 3, after all of that, God planted a garden. Now, it's not green beans and cucumbers and strawberries, although I don't know, those things might have been there. What the author means is that in the midst of an unspoiled world, God made a special place for his children to live. It's called Eden. Eden means luxury or delight. And when you read the description of the place, it certainly sounds delightful and luxurious. Four rivers, gold, aromatic resin, onyx. I mean, it's, it's described as a place we'd all like to live, right? So then God takes Adam specifically and he puts him in the garden where he is expected to work and take care of it, to, to take care of Eden. And so John Goldingay says, it seems like we were made to be gardeners. That, that is part of what it means to be made in God's image is to take care of the garden, to take care of the world. But there's one restriction. God tells Adam he can eat anything from anywhere except from one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat anything in the whole world, Adam. Just stay away from that one tree. Now, I've had people tell me that they, you know, they have issues with the story. I mean, they'll, they'll say, why did God even put that tree there? Wouldn't it have been better just to, just to leave that tree out of creation? Why even put the possibility in front of Adam? Well, far be it for me to answer for God, but... The Bible does tell us that he allows us to be tested. And the bottom line, the scripture says, is that God loves us and wants us to love him back. But he won't force us to love him. And he won't test us beyond our ability to respond successfully. He wants us to choose to love him by doing what he asks. And so this tree in the garden represents the choice that Adam has. Will he love God enough to do as he says or will he do the one thing he's been told not to do? I mean, to me, the choice seems pretty straightforward, right? Eat from any tree except that one. Hundreds, thousands, millions of trees to choose from that he can eat from. And only one that he can't. And God even tells Adam the consequences up front. He says, if you eat from that one tree, you will certainly die. Death will be part of your existence. And despite... All of the rest of the trees, there is one right next to the forbidden trees called the tree of life. And if Adam eats from that, he will live. The tree of life would provide a forever future in God's goodness and wisdom. And so it's life or death. Your choice, Adam. I, I don't think it's any mistake that right after God puts this choice in front of Adam, the very next verse, he then says, it's not good for the man to be alone. <laughs> That's when God creates Eve, right after he gives Adam this choice. Because, man, let's face it, we need help, right? Can I get an amen? Not from the ladies. I was looking for an amen from the men. Thanks, Leslie. God knew it from the beginning. Eve is even called a helper. However, things don't go the way God hopes. In fact, Adam's helper is the one who speeds up the process of humanity rebelling against God. We'll never know what might have been. The story continues tragically as a serpent enters the picture. He's hiding here in the tree, if you can kind of see him there. And he lies to Eve about the consequences of eating from the tree. But in fairness, Eve also lies in a sense. She adds to God's original instructions. God did tell them not to eat from the tree. Eve knows that. But Eve says God told them not to even touch it. Now God didn't tell Adam that. I'm sure the serpent knows that. I mean he knows when we add on to God's word or when we twist it into something it was never intended to say. Nevertheless, Eve and Adam believe the serpent's lies more than they believe what God actually said. Maybe the addition God made, or Eve made to God's instructions made her feel safer somehow. Like, you know, I, I'm not going to break God's rule if I first don't break my own rule. But what it actually does is distances her from God's wisdom. Even distances her from God himself. By adding to God's instructions, Eve becomes her own boss. 
rather than listening to God's voice. I don't know. But I do know that Genesis says the serpent's words made Eve see the fruit of the tree in a different light. It says, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, she took, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. They failed the test. And the relationship between God and humanity was broken, all because at the tree they chose to listen to the wrong voice. And now you're thinking, yeah, we know. We, they listen to the tempter's voice. Don't have anything to do with talking serpents because they lie. Got it. <laughs> but that's not the only wrong voice Adam and Eve listened to in this story. See, this story is not just about not listening to the serpent no matter what the serpent said. Because these two humans still had a choice, even though the serpent had, was trying to lure them in one way. In their hearts and minds, they still had these pretty clear instructions from God. What happens at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that Adam and Eve choose to listen to their own voice over God's. They choose to trust their own decision making, their own intuition, rather than trust what God has told them was for the best. The tree of, knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil represents autonomy, doing life on your own, ignoring, pushing God aside. And for a bit, it seems like their choice paid off. I mean, they didn't die, at least not physically, not yet. But there are things that did die immediately. For one, their trust in and their innocence with each other dies. As soon as they eat of the fruit, Genesis says, the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This has never been a problem before. Until they ate the fruit, they were completely comfortable with each other. They trusted each other. And now that they've listened to their own voice, they suddenly see the other person as, uh, I, I don't know, a threat, uh, less trustworthy. And other relational death happens when they listen to the wrong voice. And spiritual death happens as well. The next verse tells us how the two of them heard God walking in the garden. And I, wonder, I often wonder, what, it so, what does it sound like when God walks in the garden? What did they hear? Whatever it sounded like, they knew it was God, right? The, the text seems to imply that walking together in the garden was something they did on a regular basis. I mean, it certainly indicates that Adam and Eve had a close, unhindered relationship with God before this moment. They talked freely and openly. They spent time together. But now God has to come looking for them. And I, I don't think it's that God doesn't know where they are. I think God even knows what's happened, of course. But he still asks questions. He asks lots of questions. According to educators, asking questions is the best way to help children figure out and admit their mistakes. Questions help them own what they've done. And I don't know what age Adam and Eve were created at, but you could say that no matter what age, what physical age they were, they're moral children at this point. Bible teacher Kat Armstrong describes it this way. Says, she says, there's a graciousness in asking questions. God does not yell. He does not point fingers. He does not explode with anger or denigrate Adam and Eve's reach for wisdom. He asks hard questions. And he gives them every opportunity to confess, to repent, offer to change. But they don't take him up on it. They never do. Instead, they make excuses. They blame each other. They blame the serpent. It gets a little close to home there, actually, if, if I'm honest, because we all still do the same thing, don't we? We mess up and we begin looking for someone to blame. What we're terrible at is admitting that we've simply listened to the wrong voice. We've listened to our own voice. And we've eaten from the wrong tree. So when we make big decisions, maybe life-altering decisions, we first need to make sure we're listening to the right voice. And the only truly right voice for the believer in Jesus is God's voice. The problem is, and you know this, the problem is, that, and the challenge is that God speaks in a still small voice. And the world's voice, the, the tempting voice of the modern day serpents, the world's voice is just so loud and it feels overpowering. So how do we learn to listen to that gentle whisper that is the voice of God? Three things, very quickly. The first is prayer. Because you can't listen to somebody you're not in communication with, right? 
And prayer is the way that we communicate with the creator of the universe. Now, we've talked several times. We've had whole sermon series on prayer and listening through prayer. So let me just sort of sum it up this way. We spend far too much time in prayer asking for things. At least I do. I'll, I'll own that. I spend far too much time in prayer asking for things, asking God to do this or that or give me that or this. I specialize in telling God how to do things too. Not only what I want, but here's how you can give it to me also. Now, that's not good communication. I should know that. I have a college degree in communication. I, now, I'm not saying we can't or shouldn't ask for what we want. Jesus tells us to do that. He clearly says that. But that's not everything prayer should be. Prayer is first and foremost about spending time with God, walking in the garden with Him, as it were. It's, it's just hanging out in His presence, learning what He's like, and, and yes, learning to hear His voice. Now, I'm, I've never heard an audible voice from God like you have in the movies, but I have had some very strong impressions that almost always show themselves to be God's voice to me. And so we learn what that voice sounds like for us. We learn to listen in prayer. And then we test what we've heard in a couple of ways. First, we check it out through the community of faith. Now, here's one way I've experienced that. In our tradition, in our faith community, those who believe that they're called into pastoral ministry have this whole process they have to go through before they're entrusted with leadership in a church. And part of that process is having people from their faith community the one that they have grown up in or been a part of, they say, yes, that person is called. We see in him or her God-given gifts and abilities that can benefit the larger church. We even ask the, the, the church the question, would you want this person to be your pastor? If someone believes that they're called but there's no affirmation from the community of faith, they're probably listening to the wrong voice, to their own voice. In the same way, here, before we launch a new ministry or a new program, we, we sift through it at the staff table. We talk through it at leadership council table. Because we believe that if God has called us to move in that direction, He will confirm it through the community. Well, the most important way that we test what we've heard is by putting it alongside the Scriptures. I mean, there's a reason we call the Bible God's Word. Because so much of what He wants to tell us is already in there. It's been written down for centuries. Is it sometimes hard to understand? You bet. I've always appreciated what Mark Twain said about the scriptures. He said, it ain't the parts of the Bible I, that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. If we spent time doing and obeying the parts we do understand, we wouldn't have a lot of time left over to worry about the parts that we don't understand. God continues to speak through the scriptures, and so we need to know what's in there if we're going to truly know what he wants to say to us. Daily reading discussing it with your friends, with your small group, asking questions. Heavens, even listening to a sermon might be helpful. All of those things can help us know the Bible and help us discern the voice of God speaking to us. That's why we give Bibles to our third graders every year through the Bible Explorers class. Ginger has a class with them for several weeks. They go over what the Bible is and how to read it and how to understand it. They, they even have a session where they get to ask me questions about the Bible and, and pretty much anything else that they want to ask. So that when we present them with their new Bibles, like we're going to do in a few moments today, they've got a head start. I can't encourage you enough, Bible explorers and all the rest of the congregation, to read the Bible regularly. I mean, we even give you, if you don't know where to start, we give you texts every week to read. Reading the Bible gives me life, not death. And it helps me learn to listen to the right voice. So the first tree we encounter in the scriptures presents us with a choice. What voice are we going to listen to? Our own? The voice of the serpent? Or the wise, good, and kind voice of our creator, God? This morning, this first Sunday after Easter, we're going to first present Bibles to our Bible explorers, and then they're going to help us gather around the table of the Lord as we share in Holy Communion, which is something we do because Jesus told us to. Do this, he said, and remember. And when we obey, the tree of life tells us, when we obey, we will receive life and blessing and we will live long in the land God has given us. So this morning, in a few moments, we're going to come to the table as obedient people, longing to listen to the voice of our Savior today and every day. But first, we're going to pray for them. We're going to encourage our Bible explorers that they receive their own Bibles and continue their journey in learning to listen to the voice of God. So I'm going to invite the Bible explorers to come. Miss Ginger's going to come, and uh, we're going to share in that moment of blessing with them.
I'd also like to invite the families to come up uh, with their Bible Explorers at this point. Miss Ginger, I've got a microphone for you if you'd like to say a few words about this year's class. That's a mighty big tree. <laughs> I'm going to hide behind it. <laughs> so this is something that we do every single year. So every January, we invite not only just third graders, but fourth graders and fifth graders as well that may not have had the opportunity um, to go through the class. And so this is an extra special class because not only is it for the kiddos, but it's for their grown-ups as well. And so they do this together. So they do homework together and all the things um, together. And so this year um, we decided, um, this is such a fun class, like they just were so much fun. They kept me on my toes, that's for sure. Um, we decided this year that we would have them dress up as their favorite Bible character, which was pretty cool. So we had a Methuselah, we had a Peter, we had a Daniel, and then we had an ant um, from the verse from Proverbs about the ant and the sluggard. Um, so they got to pick their either their favorite uh, Bible story or Bible verse. So that was super fun. Um, and then one other thing that we do when we have Bible Explorers class is we partner them with a sponsorship. So someone from the congregation um, that sponsors this Bible for them. And so they have um, agreed to be praying for them and for their family this year as they receive their Bible. Okay. So this morning you're going to receive a Bible and a, and a case to put it in and a um, certificate for finishing the course. Yeah, let's come over here. What we're going to do is we'll have each one come and then we'll ask the families to gather around behind them to pray. We practiced this hard. No, we didn't at all. So Autumn is first. Autumn Eiler, just kneel. I'm going to just kneel, and if her family, you're fine. You're perfect. You're great. And what each, each uh, there's a family member uh, for each one who has selected a verse from the Bible that is their blessing. And so we're going to pray that over them as they receive their Bibles today. Autumn's, your prayer, your prayer comes from Proverbs 31. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. Amen. Brennan is next. There are also letters in the packets from family and sponsors, all kinds of fun stuff. Brennan, your blessing comes from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Amen. Next is Roman. Roman, your blessing is from Psalm 37. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Amen. And I bet you can guess right or you're next. <laughs> Miss Ginger's right. This was a fun class. I was asked questions I've never been asked uh -huh. before. So. We learned some new things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ryder, your blessing is from Psalm 119. May God's word be sweeter than honey to your mouth. Amen. Now you have your own Bibles. So the scriptures that are on the back of the, of the outline every week, you can read every day along with your parents. 
I would encourage you to do that and stay in the scriptures every week. Congregation, would you offer your uh, encouragement and congratulations to our Bible explorers this year? So families, if you could take all of their things, I'll invite you to be seated. The Bible explorers are going to stay because they're going to help us serve communion this morning. We lost, oh, I I thought we lost one. I was counting. Let's have a word of prayer as we prepare to receive communion. Lord, we do thank you for your word. And in that word, it reminds us how Jesus, on the last night he was with his disciples, took bread and broke it, passed it among them and said, this is my body, take and eat. After supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he passed it among them and said, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, we come together today to remember and to celebrate and to give thanks. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. To your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. As we pray in the way that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The one loaf reminds us that though we're many, we're one in Christ. When we break the bread, it's a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Miss Ginger, would you come and you and I will serve them and then... Autumn, the body of Christ given for you. Brennan, the body of Christ given for you. Roman, the body of Christ given for you. Ryder, the body of Christ given for you. It is our custom in the United Methodist Church that all who love Christ or who want to love Him are welcome at the table. So our ushers will direct you as you want to come. Come down the center aisle. There will be a station on either side so you can make two lines coming down the center aisle. I know this is different. Methodists don't do change, but we're going to try it today. Uh, you can come down the center in two lines uh, and receive the br- take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup. If uh, you are gluten-free, there are gluten-free uh, wafers here. And there are cups of juice here. The wafer that's with the juice is not gluten-free, so just peel that off and and use that. Um, You can pray and then return to your seats. If you have mobility issues and need to be served where you're seated, just let the ushers know. We'll be glad to do that as well this morning. So let's come to the table. You guys come over here. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day a daily bread, forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sin against us, forgive them, and lead us not.
let your kingdom come. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day a daily prayer. Forgive us, forgive us as we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead us not. The Father's arms are 